from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm Brett Pyatt, your host and a 20-year internet security veteran. This week, we're talking application security here with John Dixon and Dan Cornell from the Denim Group. And uh, John, can you please give a little background to the audience as to uh, why you, and uh, let Dan talk for himself, I guess, as to why the two of y'all are uh, experts in this field and why we're going to have an interesting discussion today. Well, I'll let you use that term. I've, I've been a security guy for 20 years, uh, ex-Air Force guy, learned how to do what's called intrusion detection in what used to be called the Air Force CERT here in San Antonio, AFCERT. Uh, have been in the space for a little bit over 20 years, uh, depending on how you count it, and uh, been passionate about it for a very, very long time, and have been a CISSP since 1998. So for those that uh, do that kind of stuff, I've uh, been in the game for a while, and have been working with Dan and Sheridan for, I think now, 13 plus years. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Dan Cornell, my background was as a software developer, computer science degree, and spent the you know, mid-90s and late-90s doing a lot of server-side Java development. Spent the early 2000s doing a lot of .NET development. But what I've really spent the last probably 13 or 14 years of my career doing is looking at how the applications that organizations build or the, the code that programmers write, how that impacts the security of those organizations when they release that software or expose that software out to the internet. So I probably have a, a mirror of John's background in that he's a security person coming into the world of application security. I'm an application developer that has come into the world of information security. This is great. So we'll be able to talk both business risk and software from the bottom up and top down on this episode. So there's software out there everywhere these days. I think everyone is somewhat familiar with what is software, but there's different categories of software. So there's like an app on my phone that's free that someone's written. Somehow it got to the app store. Um, There's application software I can go buy at the, the store at Office Depot. I can pick it up. It's on a shelf. It's in a box. Uh, and uh, one of you guys walked through kind of the different types of software out there that's available for consumers, businesses. How does this break down into categories? Mm-hmm. And I think you did a, a good job laying that out where the software is the stuff that makes computers do things that are interesting or valuable. And the type of software a lot of people come in contact with, obviously, if you go to Office Depot, buy some sort of productivity package, install it on your workstation. You know, now these days we see a lot of applications that get installed on your phone. Um, you also have application software that runs you know, web applications, uh, e-commerce, uh, you know, order systems, things of that nature, uh, social networks like Facebook. And what we increasingly see is that even things that you traditionally thought of as hardware, you think of processing power, you think of storage, you think of networking, even those kind of fundamental building blocks of computer systems all have a non-trivial layer of software on top of them, making that more configurable. And so if you want to look very broadly, you know, everything has software running in it, running on it, putting it in a situation where it's going to be able to provide value to folks. Uh, but again, you know, um, where most people think about interacting with software is if they're surfing Facebook, surfing the web, ordering things online, or doing things with their mobile phone. So, John, with software, we've got these different categories. Uh, would like to understand, like, software, if I buy it at Best Buy or Office Depot, should I trust the software that I get there or versus something I download out of the App Store versus something I go to www.freesoftware.com and get software? Well, first of all, I'm surprised to hear that you would buy software Best Buy. That's, uh, there's, that's certainly one way to buy it, but I think the model most predominantly is either through web-based, app, you know, web-based uh, sites or app stores. I mean, and so I think there's some level of trust uh, from the people that are able to uh, make shrink wrap software that's, I mean, there's so few now, it's the, really the big brands and those that uh, put stuff in Best Buy, but really you're talking about downloading stuff from the internet, downloading something from the App Store, and that's where the murkiness of trust becomes a challenge. And what we're seeing is that people will uh, trust brands, you know, a little, put a little bit more trust in brands so that they download a mobile app from JPMC or Wells Fargo or something like that. They know who they are. They assume there's something behind it. 
the further you get away from the financial services world, the more likely uh, that there's a little bit more risk associated with it. Uh, and so that's the big challenge. Our, our company kind of vision and motto is to build a world where technology is trusted, uh, software is trusted. And the challenge is, I get the same question from my parents and from my relatives, I don't have a great answer. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, the answer is kind of, maybe. Is there an equivalent out there in the software world to a good housekeeping seal of approval? Not really. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as John said, you, and I guess if you're, if you're installing software on your phone, let's just take an example, there are probably two major things you need to be concerned about. The first is, is this software going to attempt to do something malicious when it's on my phone? So, for example, if you go to an app store, you download a flashlight application, and strangely that flashlight application needs to access the internet and your contacts and your photos, uh, you know, that application might be doing stuff that it's not supposed to do. Uh, and so that's certainly a concern, and that's where you want to, as John said, you, know, you want to be careful of the applications you install to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, but only doing what they're supposed to do, and they're not malicious. And that's where you can look, again, through the app stores, look for trusted brands. Uh, if you are using websites, you can look for you know, communicating over you know, HTTPS uh, so that you know, yes, I'm actually talking to Amazon.com. You know, the next thing that you should also be concerned about is has this software been built in a secure manner? So I'm getting software from the from an approved provider from who I think it is. The question is, is are there flaws in this software that may open me and my data up to exposure? And so that's where if you're downloading an app that allows you to do some sort of e-commerce, the question is, did the organization that built that application, did they take the proper safeguards during the development process? Did they do the type of inspection on the software that they've built so that you know if I'm using this application in this system, not only did it come from a party that I can trust, but they also took the steps necessary so they didn't inadvertently introduce flaws that expose me to risks with my data. So it's, there's two categories, I guess, is what you're saying. There's potentially shady application developers that want to do things like make a flashlight that downloads all your contacts so they can sell your contacts to somebody. And then there might be a software developer or company that's trying to do good things of running an e-commerce store or an e-commerce app, and then they end up as a victim themselves by becoming a conduit for bad people. Well, I would just say that really when we talk about application or software security, we're talking specifically about companies that build software, organizations that build software, and they, they, they do that in a consistent way that produces software that does what it's supposed to do and nothing else. It, it, they, they create software that doesn't have vulnerabilities. So a lot of what we do are not really trying to find backdoors or malicious software, not, not very, very infrequently. It's really to find errors, software coding flaws, that were inadvertently put in software that third parties can exploit. So that's the vast bulk of what we call application security is helping companies that either build software internally or build it to, you know, as independent software vendors to publish to the world. How do they do it right and build resiliency in their software so it's not exploited? Less about, you know, making statements that it's free of malware, uh, which is particularly difficult to catch. It's really to find those vulnerabilities that happen to be in the code. Yeah, so your uh, application security is really the practice of helping companies that want to do good ensure that their software is only used to do good or do what it's designed to do. And, and nothing not, more. Nothing more. And nothing more. That's the key. So as software has evolved, uh, you had, it used to be that the software was statically built, statically compiled. Now there's these dynamic software, dynamic languages. Can you guys help me uh, go through and, and help our audience understand what's the difference between static software, dynamic software? And so for a, for, for a consumer of software, you know, that's not really gonna matter to them necessarily. Uh, again, as long as the software does what it wants or does what it's supposed to do, uh, you know, connects out to servers, they do what they're supposed to do, that's not that much of a concern. But for organizations that are building software, there are you know, tools that you can use to inspect software either statically, while it's at rest, you can look at the code, look at the binaries. Um, also, you know, dynamically looking at a running system and exercising that system to look for behaviors. 
And so what you see is with a lot of the more static type languages, you can provide, uh, the, the tools are able to provide, uh, you know, in, in certain cases, better testing of those uh, you know, statically typed environments. Uh, versus a lot of the dynamic languages, it can be really hard to do certain types of static, at least security testing on those, just because those languages are so dynamic, and that's where you've got to rely on testing those applications as they're running to observe those behaviors. So again, to the consumer of the application, not really, not really your concern, but for organizations that are saying, we need to develop an application that is going to be used by our internal users or by our customers, uh, you know, that may be one factor that would, uh, that would, that would feed into the decisions they make about the languages and the frameworks that they use. And right off the bat, that tells us that, that there's a challenge in quantifying the risk of software. You have two different ways to test. So one of the things that we really have to spend a lot of time educating security folks around is these scanners that Dan had mentioned uh, and what they're able to do, what they're not able to do. If you look at it and talk to a network security person, they talk about network scanners, Nessus, for example, they get near 100% coverage of network and host vulnerabilities, right? I mean, the, 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 the server either does this, has this patch installed or it doesn't, this TCP port's open or not. The challenge is both with the static code analysis tools and these dynamic testers that Dan mentioned, they typically get somewhere between 30 to 40, maybe 50% coverage. And that is a real challenge. There's still a bit of, of risk around auth what's called authorization or around business logic that these scanners can't pick up. And that's what we do and that's what others do to find those other flaws, you know, kind of uh, structural flaws, so to speak. And so the, the applications that you're seeing out there these days, are they 100% dynamically typed? Is 100% static? Are they, when they're, um, or are most applications a, a mix? How does that work? Because an application, I guess, is usually built up multiple software components. Right. And that's an important thing as well, is when you look at something that is going to provide value to a user, <clears throat> uh, especially let's take a mobile, mobile application example, you're going to have code that's running on the device on your Android or your iPhone or you know, Windows mobile device. That's going to be a portion of this system. Three people. That's also going to then call back probably to some sort of enterprise web service that is going to provide you know, account functionality orders and things like that. But that application also might call out to third party services as well. And so when you look at all of the things that have to combine together to provide some sort of value or to, to the user, you have to understand the interaction between those components. And that's a real challenge for a lot of organizations that are developing software to understand the systems that they're building and how the moving parts fit together because it's the intersection of these interactions is where we tend to find some of the more interesting uh, vulnerabilities and other issues in these in these systems. And you're listening to CyberTalk Radio on 1200 WAI. I'm here with Dan Cornell and John Dixon of the Denim Group and we're talking about application development and ultimately application security. So walking through, we just described that applications are typically built out of many components. And for an organization, a business, um, for John, there's software footprints that you're seeing when you go out to have conversations with them. How much of the software are they buying off the shelf from a store or downloading off the internet for free or hiring software development either on a contract basis or full-time employees to write themselves? Again, most of the work we do are for large companies that are putting out a variety of types of software. So what we'll see is, you know, most of it's web still and a lot of mobile. And so the funny thing that we encounter many times is we get to inform the security person that, in fact, they have mobile applications in app stores. Uh, we've been actually in sales meetings where we're talking to, the, you know, to the security person. Again, the security person is a person that worries about software risk, worries about application security, but the actual production of it lives in another organization arm's length away. And in many times, you'll have what are called interactive agencies, third-party agencies, building mobile apps and other software that's even further afield, they're contractors. So we've been in meetings where we said, well, hey, you know, uh, you have a, a mobile app, and they're like, no, we don't, and we just show them on the app store. And, and that has happened before. So the real challenge is with these organizations that are building software is that you have multiple teams, multiple technology stacks, in-house, outside, interactive agencies. 
And again, if you're the debt manager, you're that's not one person. If even go back to, you know, the guys at Rackspace, how many dev teams do they have out there? And do they all I mean, do they talk to each other daily? Probably not. I mean, any large organization has multiple dev teams, multiple multiple dev stacks, and you have a security person whose background is in network security that's trying to manage something that he or she doesn't understand. That's the bigger problem. Is like where is this? Where does this stuff reside in the companies that are building it? And it could be everywhere. So, this, so you're saying this is or organizational dynamic is part of how we end up with bad or or unsafe software because application security, application risk is in some risk management org, which may roll up to legal, may roll up to finance, may roll up somewhere inside the company that doesn't have anything to do with their marketing group that hired an interactive agency to link into their customer database to run a promotion at a sporting event. A- absolutely. I-, I would argue that, you know, this really fragmented uh, development, which is which is a business reality, is not a bad thing. It's just once you try to lasso and get your arms around, you know, where pockets of risk exist, it becomes a, a harder problem in the large enterprise. Again, large enterprises are going to have multiple dev teams, multiple managers, multiple stacks, everything you mentioned, and be geographically distributed. And you have one, one or two people that are just trying to figure out where the, where the vulnerabilities are. That's tough. Yeah. For, for a business, uh, are, you, are you seeing where the, yeah, I guess you're showing them even apps that are published in an app store that they're not aware of, but like, from a just landscape view out there, how many of them have a, a central version control for their software or have a, an, even a catalog of all of their libraries, all of their applications uh, that they're running? Very, <clears throat> very few organizations have a really good idea of their software attack surface. And that's, you know, as, as John said, that's, uh, there's kind of some business realities that drive this. You know, if, if I'm an organization, if I'm a development team manager, I don't, I don't get rewarded to write secure software. I get rewarded to deliver software on time and on budget that's going to provide value to customers and other stakeholders. And so what you see is, especially in organizations that grow up through acquisitions, organizations that have multiple geographic locations, multiple lines of business, what you find is there is a real sprawl of applications and software that gives that organization a tremendous amount of exposure and exposure that can be really hard to wrangle because, again, uh, you know, for, for large enterprises, they don't have a single central software shop that everything goes through. They've got a bunch of lines of business that are all operating independently trying to execute on their strategy. And so that's a real challenge for larger organizations that are trying to get going on the road to having a successful application security program in place is first you need to find out what all or, or a an activity that needs to go on is finding out what is out there because I've found very few organizations that have a really good handle on what they uh, on, on, on what from a cataloging standpoint of what their attack surface looks like but if I have antivirus on all of my computers and a, a firewall at the office do I still need to worry about application security well that's really a, a, the question is, in your organization, are you developing and deploying custom applications? Um, you know, again, everybody probably needs to be running antivirus, firewalls. Those solve different problems. When we're looking at application security, what we're really saying is for custom applications that you deploy or applications that you deploy and configure that are going to manage sensitive data for your organization, that are going to manage customer data, uh, manage customer interactions, if you are if you're if you're undertaking those activities then you need to care about application security because you may be exposing yourself through the software that you wrote the software that you deployed and configured and so for organizations that aren't building custom software you know, obviously that's not something that they need to worry about they should be concerned about the security of the systems that they're purchasing but that's really more of a supply chain or an acquisition question of if i go and use if, if, if i'm going to use this uh, you know, platform to interact with customers, I'm going to ask that vendor what they've done for security. Um, you know, if you look internally, if for organizations that are developing and deploying custom software, those are the ones that have the most need to care about application security. So if, if I'm a small business, chances are I'm, I'm buying some package, whether it's my medical practice management software, whether it's my restaurant management software, I'm, I'm buying this from someone that is writing their own custom um, applications are there is a business owner I may, I'm maybe a medical professional I'm s- super bright in my own field but I don't know a lot about 
software development, are there three things that I should be asking my software vendor that's providing my medical practice management about like what are they doing for application security? Uh, here's the challenge. If you're a small business, you can ask that question. The likelihood is if it's a big software house, you're going to have less leverage than the, the bigger guys. That's unfortunate. Uh, the reality of it is, is that uh, at least from a custom software standpoint, uh, I, I would read and find out specifically how they handle data, what they do, and you have to do that before you purchase. That's the one moment of leverage you have is before you buy it. Uh, but if you're talking, you know, licenses that are hundreds, hundreds of dollars, uh, that's a challenge. And it really wasn't to, to draw a metaphor or an a analogy. Excuse me. Uh, Salesforce.com really didn't start to bake in service level agreements until big customers started to walk away. Before that, you just accepted whatever service level, including interruptions. So the reality of it is, is bigger buyers come in, they have a bigger stick to ask those questions, but you're well served to at least know what the risk is. The honest to God truth is, is that some of the bigger names and bigger brands uh, to some degree come with some level of protection. So if you're worried about that, then the bigger brands, if you're running in-house uh, accounting software, you know, into it has been out there for a very long time. Uh, there's a, a whole hand of others that are out there. If you go with the custom one that is made in overseas, there's a kind of risk decision that you may want to think about. And then as some of these small businesses also uh, now are ending up with software compliance requirements themselves, and they certainly may not be aware of all of them or even aware, like going through there, how to, to ask their software vendors uh, for assistance on these things, whether it's even in retail. I mean, there's software requirements in PCI compliance, the payment card industry. It's a, a compliance that's self-regulated, private sector. It's not a law per se, but it's if you'd like to be able to accept credit cards at your business, you need to be compliant with it. As a uh, restaurant owner, if I have a website now and I can take orders over that website, now all of a sudden I have a, an application that needs to be PCI compliant. Uh, how am I going through, uh, or should I be going through asking questions? Should there be things that that software vendor is providing me? And you can certainly ask the software vendors what explain to us or lay out the steps that you take to secure software during development. Again, if uh, it's a credit card processing system, they should be able to talk specifically about how they meet PI PCI requirements. But honestly, for most small businesses, the smartest thing for them to do is to basically de-scope anything they're doing from PCI. And so you want to, instead of doing your own credit card processing, you want to use a credit processing or credit card processing system where you can bounce control uh, over to the credit card processor. They run the credit card transactions. They're the only ones that see the card. Those numbers never pass over your network or any of your systems. They take a handling fee, but that lets them worry about things like PCI. So you basically de-scope yourself from that PCI question. And by far, you know, that would be my recommendation for small businesses and even, uh, you know, even significant businesses where they don't want to be in the business of PCI compliance, which is fairly specialized and can be, uh, you know, can can be challenging to uh, to meet those requirements. And, and the one last thing I would add is that, you know, depending on how many transactions you process per year, obviously there's a div different level of scrutiny, uh, different levels of, of self-reporting. It's really the the highest level of I forget how many millions of transactions you have to have before you actually have to be audited. So a lot of that stuff is reflects the risk of the smaller processors, but they do need to be uh, the one thing I'd say to them is that the credit card uh, processors are pushing the risk down to the retail uh, uh, you know, providers for loss right now. So that's probably the biggest thing they're worried about is fraudulent transactions that they get stuck with and don't get absorbed by the payment processor. So that's yeah. the big risk right there. Yeah, I think everybody right now is trying to roll out the new point of sale terminals that support the chip versus just the magnetic swipe for those out there shopping at retail locations. If you um, have your card stolen and a merchant accepts the magnetic strip right now, that merchant's going to take 100% of that fraud loss versus if it's a chip and pin, then part of the thing the merchant gets from Visa or MasterCard or others is the benefit of some of that fraud protection. So you're here with Dan Cornell and John Dixon on CyberTalk Radio. Uh, after the break, we will dig deep into application security. We'll uh, pick Dan's brain and see 
if we can make everyone application security experts by the end of the hour. Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm here with John Dixon and Dan Cornell of the Denim Group, and we're talking application security. Uh, this half of the program, we're going to get into some of the technical weeds about how do you make secure software? And if you don't decide to do it from the beginning, how do you secure software you've already made? And we'll have John talk a little bit about what you do if you're in the organization responsible for determining what type of risk your company has because you talk to your insurers and your insurers want you to go quantify that so they can write you a policy and now you're out talking to all of these software development teams which are not just in your IT department anymore are they John not at all I mean so that's the first very important step because in a very competitive society you don't want to invest a dollar more than you have to you don't want to over secure your software so getting, figuring out where that equilibrium is, is the, really the role of typically a security person or an application security person that lives in the security organization. And what they have to do is they have to look at the compliance framework, which could include PCI, could include outside regular, regulatory authorities, examiners, if, if you're in a bank, look at the uh, important things of the company. For example, if they have a strong brand and they're very protective of their brand, what do they do? Do they transact money? Do they uh, have very sensitive personal data? All those things will drive the appetite for risk. And then what they have to then do is turn around and articulate that level of risk in a much more tangible way to the developers and say, this is how, this is our tolerance. Uh, you know, we may have been a DevOps and agile world. We may have an imperative to go fast. However, we always want to treat uh, customer data this way. We always want to uh, favor security over this, or you know, whatever their 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 again appetite is. That's what they have to do up front. Until the boss says, "Hit a marketing launch date," right, Dan? Exactly. And that's again, it all comes down to incentives for the dev teams, and uh, you know, what what framework are you putting in place that makes it a reasonable expectation that they're going to undertake certain activities and you know John talked a little bit about if you have auditors if you have examiners those folks have a, a stick where again from a PCI standpoint your card processor could turn you off and say you haven't done what we require that you do therefore we're going to take away your ability to, to run tr credit card transactions um, so that's a you know that's what you see in certain types of environments but then it's also doing risk management and saying if we had a breach of our customers data you know, again, this is going to have an impact on trust, on our retention of existing customers. It's going to have an impact on our ability to attract new customers. That's the, uh, you know, all those things have to factor into the risk tolerance for the organization and then translate into the specific activities that a team is going to undertake uh, for a given application. So you started off as a software developer and have moved into application security. So if, if I was a software developer today and I wanted to follow along the journey you've taken, uh, where would you recommend that they, they go to start learning application security? A great place to start is OWASP, or the Open Web Application Security Project. That's www.owasp.org, O-W-A-S-P. And what OWASP is, it's an international organization centered around open source. So they build open source tools. They also uh, release documents, uh, open source uh, you know, training materials and other things of that nature. And they run local chapter meetings. And all of these materials and the, at least the chapter meetings are free. And so that's a great resource out there. They've written guides on testing applications. They've written guides on how to build secure applications. They've got cheat sheets that focus in on very specific areas. And as I said, especially with the chapters run around the US and around the world, that's a great opportunity for folks uh, on the development side that are interested in security to go and interact with people that have experience both with software development and with security. And so that would be my first recommendation as a great starting point 
is to uh, look up OWASP, see if there's a local chapter. Um, you can participate in mailing lists, download things like their OWASP top 10 list of web application risks. Uh, again, testing guide, development guide. There's a lot of great materials out there that can start you on the road as a developer to learn a lot more about how to better build secure software in a more repeatable manner. And I just want to add also, for those organizations that are in the financial services world, and certainly anyone that processes credit cards, there is something called the Data Security Standard. And the DSS, as it's commonly known, has a section six, I think, that articulates all the specific uh, security controls you can do around applications. So that's another area where, and this is a little bit more prescriptive, and for those that handle credit card data, they can invoke that, they can point to it and say, okay, it says we have to do instructor-led training or some type of training. It says we need to do penetration tests for applications. We need to have a web application firewall. Uh, I think the PCI DSS drives more uh, activities in most of these organizations than anything else. It's certainly more prescriptive than HIPAA or some of the other kind of uh, security you know, uh, guidance uh, documents. Yeah. So if I've, I've gone out and I'm, as a software developer, I, I wrap my head around this OWASP top 10. Am I like at the middle of the pack now? As, as you go out and look at applications and you, you do assessments as part of the, what your, your company offers, how often do you run into an app that has one of those top 10 as a vulnerability? I'm almost, uh, almost all the time. And so uh, you know, knowing the OWASP top 10 is a great document for uh, awareness and uh, you know if, if you're the average software developer walking around if you have or if you're familiar with the OWASP top 10 if you understand how to avoid introducing instances of the OWASP 10 into your applications that, that puts you well ahead of, of a lot of the developers out there as an individual and so that's a great thing to become familiar with uh, you know I would argue that the OWASP top 10 is well, I wouldn't argue. It's, it's, it's certainly an industry-wide document and is not going to be specific to a, a, any given organization. But again, as a starting point, and if you look at how many organizations haven't even considered these types of application security risks, that is a great place to start to understand the problem and some things that could be done about it. You know, beyond that, there's obviously a lot more to learn. There's more than 10 things that you can do wrong to impact the security of an application. But uh, as a starting point, the OWASP Top 10 is a, is a fantastic starting point. And the thing to emphasize to people less familiar with application security is the OWASP Top 10 is essentially a taxonomy of the types of vulnerabilities one might encounter or one might produce in, when you're doing custom software. Again, this is compared to network or, or host vulnerabilities where you have a specific vulnerability to a device that is sold you know on the marketplace something that's particular to cisco or to microsoft or to adobe so what we're talking about is a class of vulnerabilities uh, vulnerabilities that look kind of like this but are essentially manifest themselves different they're all snowflakes uh, and that's the challenge that a lot of security guys have to to understand is that when we talk about application security the oauth top 10 we're talking about essentially a, a, a class that looks like this parameter tampering or input validation. They all look slightly different, but developers have, have implemented them in those, in those very custom apps in a custom way. So as a, a category, as you say, that OWASP top 10 has categories, so I'm a little bit of an old guy. So if I uh, read this paper years ago, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit, it talks about buffer overflows. It's kind of a seminal application security paper that was written out there. Would that be one of those 10 categories would be buffer overflows, or have we fixed all those now and, and something else is in the top 10? So uh, a couple thoughts on that. Like n Number one, you're exactly right in saying the OWASP top 10 is a list of classes of vulnerabilities and uh, buffer overflow is a class of vulnerability. Uh, the really early versions of the OWASP top 10 did list buffer overflows. That's no longer included on in the OWASP top 10 list and that's not because buffer overflows aren't a problem. They are. Uh, they're typically found in applications written using C and C++. And because we're looking at the OWASP, the web application top 10, there aren't a lot of web applications these days that get written in C and C++. And so buffer, if you look across all software being developed, buffer overflows are still a significant concern. 
if you look more specifically at web applications, they're typically being built with languages and frameworks that provide some resilience against specifically buffer overflow attacks. And so the, uh, the web application top 10 doesn't include buffer overflows because they're talking about web application software that people are building. So something that, that people if you're, uh, in the IT world, you may be familiar with uh, SQL Server databases. SQL is the SQL is the standard query language. It's out there all the place. So for a web application, um, I'll guess another one that might be in the top 10, a, a SQL injection attack. So this is where your, your web application talks to a database. Is that something you have to think about or in the, the top 10 there? Exactly. Those injection flaws, specifically SQL injection, are very common to web applications. They're incredibly damaging. And so SQL injection, uh, and injection flaws in general, are uh, you know, figure prominently in the OWASP top 10. Uh, I would love to get to a world where they didn't anymore. Uh, that's going to require a, a lot of work on a number of people's parts in order to in order to make that the case. But SQL injection is a great example. Uh, again, giving an attacker the ability to control the database queries that are run. You also so see things like uh, the use of uh, known vulnerable components uh, is another uh, class. You also see things like cross-site scripting, where a malicious attacker can run JavaScript code in a user's browser. and uh, So it's other uh, vulnerability classes like that that are have a combination of being very widespread when you look at the security of web applications, but also where those instances of those vulnerabilities expose the organization to a, a high degree of risk. And let me try to explain, go back and explain the SQL injection in layperson's terms, because I've tried to explain this to friends and family and and others and, and try to impress upon them why this is so damaging. Essentially, web applications take input and particularly uh, they take in the form typically of text. So like if you were to log in and you have a username and password, that, that's text, right? Brett at, and you have a password that in your case is particularly complex and hard to guess. I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Uh, but what, what SQL injections are and why they're so pernicious is that Essentially, if you had a single quote or a tick, that if you didn't have the right uh, code written, the language written, that the database would interpret that tick as a as a signal to it to say, okay, after this tick, everything else after that actually execute a database command. So, Bill O'Brien after the the after the O, it would say, okay, you could essentially send in a database command. That database command can delete data can copy it back, can do anything on that database manually. So guys write these scripts to do this in a recursive manner. And so from a web input, from like a, a, a login, you could essentially do everything. And from the outside looking in, it looks like regular web traffic because I can't really interpret that. Uh, and that's why it's so evil. You're not gaining root access. You're not compromising the host. You're just enumerating and getting this information because of this one small, uh, you know, kind of flaw in the code. So yeah, you've you've turned somebody's web server, their website, as a, an attacker. You've now turned it into a console on their database server, effectively. So you can do all the stuff that you would do from being logged into the database server, and every company would go, "Well, I wouldn't let any random person on the internet log into my database server." But this is what happens every single day if you have a website that has a a database injection vulnerability. And, and I would say in our travels and our assessment work that we do across numerous industries, we see that at least 30% of the time, maybe more. And that so that is, it is a lethal, I should maybe that's too strong a word, it's a very dangerous uh, vulnerability. We see it all the time. Yeah, so uh, how do I test for, this is, this is one I think that's very common, uh, how do I test for that on my own? Are there good tools? Yeah, so there's a, you know, kind of two major approaches to testing applications. You're either going to statically test an application, that's where you're looking at the application source code or the application binary, building a model and running some sort of analysis. This can, again, either be done in an automated way um, or you know, can, can obviously be done manually as well. Uh, or you would test the, uh, a running system, do dynamic analysis. And there's also you know, some new types of analysis doing interactive that's kind of a combination of the two. But if you look at the two major schools, so on the static side, what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to look at the application code and see where potentially malicious inputs get passed into the application. In John's example, that would be the username parameter that gets passed into the application. And then I'm going to watch where that malicious, potentially malicious information, how it flows through the data in that program. I'm going to look for it to get appended to other strings, and ultimately I'm going to look for it to be sent to a sensitive function. So if I have a username passed in, that gets appended into a database query that's being run, and then that query gets passed off to the database. If you're not properly escaping for um, you know, potentially malicious values, uh, that's how you identify those kinds of things. Again, that can be you can manually do that by manually reviewing code. You can do it in a lot of cases at better scale with automated tools. From the dynamic side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass inputs into the application. I'm going to watch the responses. And so if I pass in the username dan at denimgroup.com and get a normal response back, that's fine. If I pass in the response dan apostrophe, but I get some sort of a database error message back, so that apostrophe is a SQL, a special character for uh, your SQL queries. And if I can send in one of those special characters and cause an error, that is some evidence to me, hey, this application might not be handling this input appropriately because I'm able to cause these error messages to show up when I sent you know, what should be a character that you would think that the application would be able to handle. And again, that's something that you can do manually. It's also something that can be automated to, uh, to, to do testing for SQL injection at greater scale. Yeah. So if, if I was a software developer and I was hired by a, a company and the company's uh, got a bunch of, they tell, IT manager says, we've got a bunch of applications. We had some third-party development firms write them for us over the years. We don't actually have any developers on staff. You're going to be our, our first developer. Um, can you go through and make sure that we're safe? Where should that developer start? <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, let me think. Just, on, the, on jobs uh, boards? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on Monster? Uh, no, I, I, the first thing, it, you know, let, let's say you inherit a portfolio of applications. Let's say they were given to you. My first assumption is that's not the incomplete census of all the applications that are out there. So the first thing I would try to figure out is where does everything live? And what I would do would be to dynamically scan, not look at source code, but dynamically scan and try to determine what the surface area is, is, as Dan had mentioned. What you're trying to figure out is how much stuff is actually out there. I'd focus primarily initially on the outside stuff. Um, the inside stuff could be bad too, but like the outside stuff can, with SQL injections, cross-site scripting errors can, can really um, attract badness. I would look in the app stores, I'd try to find out what the attack surface is, and at least eliminate the most egregious and most easily found vulnerabilities like the ones we mentioned. Yeah, so are there some open source tools I could go download and start with that'll help me, or where, do, where do I go? There are, and so I'd really recommend that folks go and take a look at an OWASP project. It's called OWASP ZAP, or Z Attack Proxy. And what that is, is a it's a web proxy, so it lets you control, it lets you basically craft and send in custom requests to web applications so that you can see the responses. That helps with a lot of manual testing that you might want to do. But it also has a, an, an automatic ability to go and fuzz an application or send in a lot of random inputs and look at the responses. And that can help you identify things like SQL injection, things like cross-site scripting. And a great thing about OWASP Zap is that it's, number one, it's, it's freely available. It also has a very active developer and user community, and there's a lot of tutorial materials out there that can help you if you're someone that doesn't necessarily have a strong background already in web application security. It can help get you started along the way to understand, here's how I can run a scan with Zap, here's how I can start to do some manual testing. And also we've seen some really exciting stuff being done with Zap, integrating that into development tool chains. And so just like you would run unit tests or you'd run acceptance tests, you can also automate running Zap in order to do security testing. And you can start to integrate that if you have a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline, you can start to integrate testing like that into those pipelines. So uh, we've seen some pretty cool uses of Zap for that specific use case. Um, again, great, great tool. Uh, a guy named Simon Bennett uh, is, the, is the 
project lead on the tool, but it has a really robust community, and that's a for developers interested in app security. That's a great tool to use as a starting point to kind of springboard uh, for you know, toward more advanced activities down the road. So I, I got myself Zap. Maybe I got myself Nmap to start off first, and I scanned to find out just where do I even have systems. I got myself Nessus. I scanned those systems. I found out I have some apps running on them. I have some web apps. I got Zap. I've now scanned them with that. I now have a catalog, John, that it looks like all these things that say critical, error, warning, alert, these are all bad. How do I go to my management team as a developer and walk them through a the risk that I'm seeing as a technical professional that I don't feel comfortable with? I mean, I would apply the 80-20 rule here and obviously try to get the most uh, egregious vulnerabilities kind of in one category and push everything else off to the future. Uh, what I would try to do, again, uh, many of the folks that end up having that discussion are on the security side of the house, but if you happen to be a development manager, I would go and find somebody either in the audit or security side or risk management side to help you articulate that. Because what we found is that many developers, if not most, are so focused on features and functionality that they don't have a lot of that context. Their head's down for the next release. If I were in that role, I would go to these other people who are not in the next cube or in the next office, but probably further away, and try to essentially take that critical and say, what is the impact of the business? And find that out. And then that, then you have to put it in English and say, look, if, if we have this SQL injection off of our, off our web page, here, here is what the impact's gonna be of the business. If you're a payment processor, we may get, uh, you know, we may get breached and this happened to Heartland Payment Systems several years back. This happened to several others in the space. They could not process payments. That's the business impact. So without sounding too doomsday, uh, you have to essentially tell the story in the context of the business and appeal to that business risk appetite that, that you may or may not be aware of and say, look, this is the impact. Like if we get nailed, we're down. I mean, or, um, you know, we are we lose our customer data. Our, you know, we now become the guys that lost the customer data, and we spend the next three months not on product releases, but on backpedaling to, you know, do triage. So now I'm, we're walking through this cycle. So I found my problems. Let's say they said, yes, go fix them. Uh, but I'm one developer, and then the CFO says, yeah, this really is scary. Here's a check. If I'm going to go out and try to find people to help me because I they they'd had some third-party firms write these things before they weren't apparently very safe and secure because you've now found all these problems how do I go as a developer that knows a little bit but I'm not at a super security developer level how do I go find firms to help me fix these things and fix them properly well I don't want to be totally self-serving here but uh, as a nice well-worn firm in San Antonio that does that uh, no, here's what I'd say is uh, you have, do not try to do this yourself. I mean, uh, that is the business case that you laid out to get third party help. Uh, there are a variety of folks that are in this uh, space that do a good job. And here's the other thing, how, you know, there are companies like ours essentially have learned how not to do it the right way. We've learned through observation and through lots of repetition how not to build software and we've and, and we've seen how other companies have made the business case internal and how they've not done it how they've responded to breaches essentially how, you know, if you want to get to, to, to a better place really quickly um, it is going to take resources it's not going to be easy and you don't want to do it by yourself so the types of things that you would you would you would ask people to do is essentially look at the maturity of your software program in general to see if testing, if verification, if the policies, the training, all these things are up to where they should be within your industry subsector. And again, that's the power of having third parties come in is to say, look, you know, you really, you know, that training that you did three years ago is great. It was surface level and half of your developers are no longer here. Uh, you need to do something that's a little bit more sustainable. That's the kind of thing that uh, you probably need help with at that point. The other thing I do is I'd make sure within the security organization you have a hardcore AppSec person in, in house. Maybe that's a hire directly for that person, but it's also too hard. It's difficult to repurpose people at that point and say, learn while you're doing. 
and I would go and hire a full, you know, full-time AppSec person to direct uh, goodness. Yeah. Well, thank you, John, for closing us out with some good tips on uh, what to do and make sure that you keep your application software safe. I'd like to thank uh, Dan Cornell and John Dixon for joining us on CyberTalk Radio uh, discussing application security. And thank you, and have yourself a good evening. Our pleasure. Thank you.